Hey everyone, imagine a time where castles were not just homes for lords and knights, but powerful fortresses that could change the course of a war. We're talking about the Middle Ages, where siege warfare was one of the most important tactics, especially from the 11th century onward, when castles spread across Europe, battles were less about clashing armies on the battlefield and more about capturing or defending these fortified structures. The strategy became simple, win the siege and you often won the war, especially if the target was a crucial city or stronghold. Now, let's dive into the defenses of these castles and cities. Early on, in the 11th century, places like France and Britain started building what's called the Mott and Bailey castles. Basically, they put a wooden tower on a mound, whether natural or man-made, called a Mott, and surrounded it with a courtyard at the base called a Bailey. The whole thing was surrounded by a ditch or moat, which could either be dry or filled with water. Over time these castles were upgraded to stone, which made them way tougher against fire. The designs kept improving as the idea of these stone fortresses spread across Europe. One of the weakest points of any castle was the main entrance. So, what did they do? They fortified it with towers on either side, added a drawbridge, a heavy metal gate called a portcullis, and even murder holes, which were these openings where defenders could drop missiles or pour burning liquid on attackers trying to get in. Some castles, like the famous Carnarvon Castle in Wales, took it to the next level with two drawbridges, six portcullises, and five doors protecting the entrance. Cities also took their gates seriously, building such massive entrances that many of them still stand today. As for the outer defenses, walls were typically surrounded by a moat, and wherever possible, castles were built on raised ground. In places where that wasn't an option, like in the Low Countries, they made the moats extra wide. Towers were added to the walls at regular intervals to allow archers to rain down arrows on the enemy, and sometimes they built wooden overhangs so defenders could shoot from above without being exposed. Eventually, they realized that round towers were better than square ones because they didn't have vulnerable corners, and they were harder for enemies to take down from the base. But castles didn't just have outer walls. By the late 12th century, many castles started adding a second, inner wall. This made things even harder for attackers because they now had to breach two walls, and defenders could fire over the first wall from the second. If the attackers somehow managed to break through both sets of walls, there was still one last line of defense, the keep, a large fortified tower with an entrance on the first floor for extra protection. And of course, Let's not forget about the defenders themselves. Castles were usually home to knights and soldiers who could launch surprise attacks on the enemy, sometimes sneaking out through secret gates. Archers and crossbowmen fired through narrow windows, while catapults hurled massive rocks at the enemy or their siege engines. In some cases, defenders even used a secret weapon known as Greek fire, a highly flammable liquid that was launched at attackers. When all else failed, they resorted to anything they could throw. Burning oil, logs, spikes, you name it. And after the attackers weighed their options against those impressive castle defenses, the next move was usually to encircle the target. The idea was simple. Cut off food and supplies, wait for the defenders to run out, and force a surrender. Sometimes the attackers would go a step further and burn the nearby farmland and villages to make sure nothing could be smuggled in. But here's the catch. This tactic could take months. Castles were often well stocked with food and might have access to their own water supply. In a pinch, defenders could turn to wine, beer, or, if things got really bad, even horse blood to survive. Some castles, especially those in Wales built by Edward I, were located right by the sea, making it even harder to starve them out, unless the attackers had control over both land and sea. And castles weren't the only ones playing tricks. Some had secret tunnels to sneak in supplies or people, even while surrounded. When a whole city was the target, encircling it completely was tough, if not impossible, unless you had a massive army. Still, some commanders pulled it off. Take the Siege of Antioch during the First Crusade. 
The attackers actually built their own castles to keep themselves protected from any counterattacks from the city. This wasn't uncommon either, sometimes they'd throw up a siege castle right in front of a gate to block any movement while the rest of the army moved on. Of course, the ideal scenario was to get the defenders to surrender right away. Sieges were costly, and armies could only serve for so long before their time ran out. Plus, the campaign season, spring and summer, was limited, so there was always a sense of urgency. The longer the attackers stayed, the more they risked running out of supplies, getting sick, or even being attacked by reinforcements. But sometimes, sheer intimidation was enough. Having a big army or a famous leader like Henry I or Joan of Arc could make defenders think twice. If that didn't work, the next move was to send a message, sometimes quite literally. In the age of chivalry, there were times when civilians were allowed to leave before things got ugly, but not always. If surrender terms were rejected, terror tactics weren't off the table. Severed heads of messengers or captives might get catapulted over the walls as a grim reminder of what was coming. In one extreme case, King Stephen threatened to hang someone's son in plain sight unless the defenders gave up. Now, if waiting didn't seem like the best option, the attackers might try something more aggressive, like using battering rams. The gate had always been a weak point, but as fortifications improved, it became one of the strongest parts of a castle. Still, attackers often tried to break through with fire or a good old-fashioned battering ram. These rams, made of massive logs with a metal tip, hadn't changed much since ancient times. They could be carried by men, placed on wheels, or hung from a frame to swing with even more force. The defenders of course had their tricks, like using ropes or chains to pull the ram off course or destroy it. Another method was to pound the walls with artillery. Huge catapults or trebuchets, capable of hurling boulders up to 250 kilos, could do serious damage to walls. Sometimes they'd launch flaming missiles covered in pitch to set fire to the wooden buildings inside. Other times they'd use containers filled with flammable liquids, like animal fat, that acted like ancient Molotov cocktails. Meanwhile, defenders fired back with giant crossbows called ballistas, launching huge bolts with deadly accuracy. In later times, things got even more creative, with attackers using kites to drop fire from above, or even resorting to sulfur gas to smoke out defenders. And as gunpowder weapons came into play, we started to see early cannons, though they were as dangerous to the people firing them as they were to the enemy. By the 15th century, with massive cannons launching cannonballs over 100 kilos, traditional siege warfare was reaching its end. The thick stone walls of medieval castles just couldn't keep up with the firepower. So, if the walls looked too thick or too strong to break down with missiles or battering rams, the attackers had another option, undermining. This tactic was as sneaky as it was dangerous. Basically, the attackers would dig tunnels beneath the walls, trying to weaken them enough so they would collapse under their own weight. Sometimes they'd just pick away at the stones using tools, and they'd shield themselves from enemy fire with wooden shields or covered trenches. But the more advanced version involved digging tunnels and then setting fires in them. The heat and smoke would cause the walls above to give way. Of course, this wasn't always possible, especially if the castle was built on solid rock. And defenders weren't just sitting around waiting for their walls to collapse. They'd dig their own counter tunnels, known as counter mines, to intercept the enemy's work. Sometimes, they'd even set their own fires in these tunnels, hoping to smoke out the besiegers or make the tunnels collapse. A famous case of undermining happened at Rochester Castle in England in 1215, where a whole corner of the keep came crashing down after the attackers set a massive fire using wood and pig fat in their tunnel. Now, if all else failed, the attackers might go for an all-out assault with siege towers. These massive wooden structures were assembled on site, sometimes given names like the cat or the bear, and rolled up to the walls using manpower or oxen. Imagine the fear that must have caused, but before they could roll them into place, attackers had to fill in any moats or trenches.
Sometimes they used folding bridges to get the towers closer. Once they reached the walls, the real fight began. These towers weren't just big, they were deadly efficient. Some had platforms that could lower men right onto the walls, while others were armed with battering rams or cranes to drop men over the walls. Archers inside the towers could fire down from a higher position, clearing the defenders off the walls before the attackers stormed across on their own drawbridges. Siege towers were no joke, they could be massive, like the ones used during the Siege of Lisbon in 1147, which stood a staggering 80 feet high. Of course, defenders tried to burn them down with fire arrows, but attackers soaked the towers in water or covered them with metal plates to make them fireproof. On top of that, defenders sometimes dug out their own trenches to make the ground unstable, causing siege towers to collapse as they approached. And in some cases, defenders even built their own towers to fight back more effectively. But if brute force didn't work, sometimes trickery did. Chivalry was supposedly a big deal back then, but in reality, there were plenty of dirty tricks on both sides. Forging letters from a king ordering a commander to surrender. That happened. A few men sneaking in disguised as locals? Also happened. And even the supposed code of honor could be thrown out the window, like when leaders were sometimes shot while discussing peace terms. Henry V once had dead animals thrown into wells during the siege of Rouen in 1418 to contaminate the water supply. Attackers would also launch manure, rotting corpses or anything they could find to spread disease inside the castle walls. Spies were constantly on both sides, looking for weak points or opportunities to attack when the other side wasn't paying attention, like during dinner time. Now, what happened if the attackers finally broke through? Well, things usually got pretty grim. When a city or castle fell, the attackers often went on a rampage, pillaging, burning, and worse. It wasn't uncommon for civilians to face the worst of the violence, while soldiers, who were considered professionals, might be spared. Even if a commander wanted to show mercy, it wasn't always easy to control a frenzied army. For example, William the Conqueror wanted to be lenient after capturing Dover in 1066, but his men ignored him in the heat of the moment. On the flip side, sometimes the destruction was deliberate, like when Edward III ordered the massacre of Caen after its fall in 1346 to send a message to his enemies. If the castle had strategic value, the victors might repair and reuse it, and if they were unlucky, they could even end up defending it themselves during the next siege, as the whole brutal process repeated. That's the harsh reality of medieval siege warfare. Brutal, cunning, and unforgiving.